such an intelligent way to express compassion. We need it more than ever. It's beautiful. And it's even more beautiful seeing it in this curved hall. Just like that. And the message is universal. I mean, this is uh, what is being said here. It should be said everywhere. how wonderful these messages are coming across through the art. You know, I'm thrilled. I mean, I see everybody here. And it's just beyond belief. It was six years in the making, doing it and getting it here and getting all the endorsements we needed to, to qualify to be at the UN. And uh, so it's here. It's amazing. Happy Tuesday, everyone, and welcome to a very special edition of Richard Skipper Celebrates. Who or what are you celebrating today? For those of you who are here for the first time, welcome. My show is all about celebrating, celebrating life, celebrating art, celebrating artists. And I'm so excited about today's guest. I actually met him very briefly in the summer uh, when I was at the Westport Playhouse when they were honoring uh, Lawrence Langner with a Literary Landmark Award. Uh, a, a plaque at the theater. And that was uh, really spearheaded by a dear friend of mine, Joel Vig. And Joel Vig said that I should reach out and get uh, Migs on the show. Well, I went to Migs' website, and on his website, he says that he never says no. He is a lifelong Westport resident, one of my favorite places on the planet, and his award winning graphic artwork can be seen all over the town and beyond. Uh, what a great way to begin a biography because it's true to his word. He didn't say no to me. So, Nick, <laughs> I'm thrilled that you're here today. How are you? I'm good, and thank you. I'm uh, thrilled to be celebrated by you and your well, audience. I believe that everyone should be celebrated, and you absolutely should be celebrated. Uh, but I want to ask you, as I ask all of my guests on my show, mm -hmm. who or what have you celebrated today? Uh, well, I'm involved in this artist group in town called the Artist Collective of Westport, and we and I just came from a meeting literally 10 minutes ago f from this artist group or the directors of this group. And we celebrate artists. I, I, I like you, I, I'm an artist and I know artists and my father was an artist and I grew up in this town, which was known as an artist community uh, way back when. And I, it still is. People think we've kind of lost that um, honor, but uh, the artists maybe are not as well known or, household names as they used to be in the 60s and 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, or even the 1920s. But um, yeah, so I celebrate artists and art because uh, they express things and share things that are important to us all. Absolutely. Well, it's very interesting, Migs. Um, with all of my guests, I always ask for a photograph of them at five years of age. <laughs> because to me, the five-year-old self uh, is the purest self. It's before life begins to tell you who you are or who you should be or who you shouldn't be. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, doing my research on you, I mean, I love this <laughs> photograph, first of all. You haven't changed a bit. The hair is <laughs> the same. Uh, maybe a little different, but it looks the same. Um, what can you tell us about this little boy, first of all? Well, uh, that's it. You know, I hadn't looked at this picture uh, anyway um, for a while. Uh, I, yeah, I look so. I don't know. I think I think it was taken in New. I was born in New Jersey, and I, I have a feeling that. And then we moved to Stamford when I was three or four, so it could have been taken. Most likely, it was taken in Stamford, Connecticut, where we where my family lived before we moved to Westport. So I was. I hadn't. I didn't have a brother yet. I had a brother when I was five, just turned. So I'm my brother. My mother maybe been pregnant then, but. Um, so up to that point, I was an only child, and my father was an artist. And um, I, I, 
you know, like kids, we just played in the, the, you know, there was a book a long time ago that my parents gave me and the title was, where did you go out? What did you do? Nothing. That's what a kid's typical answer was. And mm -hmm. yet your whole day was filled with, you know, looking for grasshoppers or, you know, finding ladybugs or, you know, looking for worms under rocks. And so I think I was that kind of kid. I had a bike and ride around the neighborhood and fall off our bikes. You know, I mean, it was just, <laughs> it was just a kid. I didn't have any special talents or. Well, we're yeah. going to get there because, I mean, the talents were there. You just didn't know it. Uh, your father uh, was an artist uh, also. Uh, you said that you were born in New Jersey, and I think that you moved to Stanford around four or five years, uh, uh, to uh, Westport around four or five years of age, or am I wrong on that? Yeah, yeah. No, I think I was four. If I, I should do my own research. I think I was four <laughs> when my parents moved to Westport. Uh, we moved here in 1950, and I'm 77. So, uh, well, maybe I was three. I don't, I don't know how that worked. I can't do math. But well, was yeah. there, I mean, was there any particular reason why your family went from New Jersey to Connecticut? I mean, hmm. was your father looking for an artist community? Because, uh, as you said earlier, uh, Westport is really known for its artist community. Yeah, there was, and I'm not sure how it happened, but it was kind of in the in the uh, ether uh, that artists there was kind of, you know, this psychic call to artists to come to Westport. I mean, my father was an illustrator uh, and he started his career in New Jersey, but you know, there was nothing, no, no, no slights on New Jersey. There was nothing great going on in New Jersey with the arts at the time. And he either knew people that a uh, new artist, maybe he went to college with or something and the call went out, you know, like smoke signals or something. Westport's the place to be. First of all, it's close to New York, uh, close enough to New York to, to carry on assignments and commerce, which is about 50 miles away and, and far enough away from New York to enjoy the country life. You know, Westport was very, is, still is. I mean, it's commercialized and, and a lot, but, um, you know, we're on the shore and there's a river and there's beautiful you know, it's a, just a beautiful place to be. So I think artists, especially in the early 50s, when my parents moved here, uh, they were attracted to that. And other artists, had, had they heard the call that this is the place to be for artists, and which was true. Yeah, uh, you, have a, you have a brother also? Um, yeah. So I have a brother, younger brother, Trace. He's five years younger. And we do uh, a podcast together. Yeah. And he became a musician. I mean, he was more interested in music. Now he's into the arts and he does his own visual art. And uh, we do a podcast together, actually, if I can plug it. It's called uh, of course. Of course. Uh, Oh Brother, Not Another Podcast. That's the name of it. <laughs> That's and, a great title. <laughs> and we're on all the platforms, you know, wherever you look, Spotify and Apple, iTunes. I mean, whatever. Uh, but yeah, it, but strangely, we... Well, we were close. We we're very close. Well, living at home, we were close because we were close. We lived, you know, in the same room in a small little house. But, uh, you know, we sort of went our own ways. We got married, had kids, et cetera. Now we both got divorced and we kind of came back together again to do something, collaborate. But yeah. Um, so, you know, my brother was born in 1950. So he was born pretty much the year we moved here. Uh, wow. Yeah. Now, if if I'm and again, if I'm incorrect on anything, you'll correct me. But uh, when you first uh, went away to college, uh, you were pursuing a theatrical career instead of uh, this career that you now have as an artist. Um, what led you in that direction, and what changed your mind? Yeah, well, it's actually a little more complicated story than that. I, I went to Carnegie. It was then Carnegie Institute of Technology. Uh, it, uh, my graduating class, they announced that, that the Mellon family had endowed the, the university with, I don't know, $400 million and bought the naming rights. So it became, from then on, it was Carnegie Mellon, but I'm the last graduating class of Carnegie Institute of Technology. I went there as an electrical engineer, believe it or not. Um, so and I, I didn't graduate as an electrical engineer. I was an electrical engineer for maybe a semester and I saw the writing on the wall and my grades going into the toilet. And uh, 
I was desperate. I didn't want to flunk out. I was a pe petrified of telling my parents I was going to flunk out. And all the people, the friends I had made in the student union, all the people I ended up sitting with and talking with and having a shared sense of humor and a shared worldview, whatever that was as a teenager, uh, were all in the theater department. And they used to, they'd ask me, you know, well, you know, what do you study? Are you an actor? Are you a director? No, I'm an electrical engineer. And they said, <laughs> you're out of your mind. You, you have to come out, come with us. It was like, come to the dark side, you know? And um, so these are people that are already my friends. And uh, they, they kind of convinced me that you don't belong. We know you, you don't belong. You're not an engineer at heart. I knew that already. I think I just needed the convincing. So I, luckily Carnegie has a phenomenal world-renowned engineering department as well as you know you know a, a theater department right and i to this day i can't explain how i didn't want to flunk out so without telling my parents or anything i went to the theater department and said i want to make a i want to move from this engineering to theater i <laughs> i had nothing to show for it, except that I wasn't the Staples players at Staples High School in Westport, but I wasn't an actor, I was a lighting person. So on that basis, they kind of wedged me in. I don't think they wanted to lose the tuition. And um, so I was accepted as a, as a theater student, like in my second semester and um, became study. You know, the first year you have to do all the basics. You have to take an acting class, a body movement class, a directing scene, right? You have to do all the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And then you choose your major in your um, sophomore year. Is there and, any uh, area in all of that that you really gravitated, uh, gravitated uh, towards yeah. the most? Well, scene design. Well, I'd done lighting in, in high school. That was sort of my thing, not my desire, but I wasn't an actor. So I was relegated to the crew, the stage crew. And I did lighting because I think I was the only person that was, wasn't afraid to get up on a ladder and aim the lights. So by default, I became the lighting person. Um, and then in Carnegie, yeah, so I, I, I chose scene design, which kind of encompassed lighting to some degree. So mm -hmm. in scene design, I hadn't shown any artistic, even though my father was an illustrator, but that's sort of the last thing a lot of times kids... They either pursue what they they want to be what their father is or they want to stay as far away from it as possible and i think my inclination was my father was so established that there was no way i was going to be an illustrator or be as good as him and i found my own path but scene design kind of tapped into some artistic streak that i must have had or inclination and uh yeah so we learned how to paint you know the basics of it were you know you we, in the old days, you had sets, there were, you know, canvas flats, they were called sets, pieces, and you had a paint thing to look like a brick wall or a marble wall, or you know, everything had to be faux. Everything was a faux something, and just with paint to make it look like it's dimensional or textural. And um, so I enjoyed that. And then lighting, I did some lighting too. And um, and that's, and I got a degree in scene design. And um, didn't do a whole lot with it. <laughs> oh, but I apprenticed at the Westport Playhouse uh, for a couple of years when I was in high school. Well, I think once my like senior year of high school, and then I think when I came back from college, my one summer. Yeah. Uh, what brought you back to Westport? Uh, well, uh, <laughs> poverty, I guess. <laughs> I guess. In the arts? You no, know, well, yeah. In the, <laughs> hard to believe. No, yeah. Well, I hadn't really, I don't, I didn't have a career. I mean, I graduated from college. I really had no, you know, they told you, I was already kind of disenchanted with scene design because they said, you know, well, expect to apprentice for 10 years and make no money on Broadway. Apprentice for some established scene designer, if you're lucky, if you can get an apprenticeship or an internship for 10 years, and then maybe, maybe you'll get an off, off, off Broadway show. And then in another 10 years, you'll do that. I was too impatient. I just wanted to do something, sink my teeth into something. Anyway, so I came home because I had no money. I had no job. And I got some local just job, jobs, routine jobs at a liquor store and, um, and a toy shop. And, a, and I worked at Pepperidge Farm for a while. And, um, and then I did get a job designing a set at, at Trinity College in Hartford. And then... I'm trying to remember, I started painting. I, I started doing pop art paintings. Well, Andy Warhol went to Carnegie Tech 
15 years before me. So he, he was always kind of this uh, hovering, um, you know, um, yes. godlike, yeah, you know, uh, figure at Carnegie. I mean, everyone talked about people that were there, those teachers still, you know, remembered him and said he was one of the best figurative artists they'd ever seen. He hadn't done pop art in Carnegie. He was a figurative artist. Anyway, so I don't know that. And then his pop art thing came and I and I just kind of related to it and said, well, you know, I really I'm not trained to draw, but I can do this pop art thing. So I started doing those pop art things in Westport when I was living at home. And then I moved out of the house and I got a dingy little apartment and I was still doing pop art and silk screening prints. And I was that was sort of the beginning of my artist life you know, just uh, scratching by as an artist, selling prints and doing portraits, pop art portraits for people. I mean, it was all the rage then. Pop art was the big deal. And I was the poor man's Andy Warhol. So friends and uh, friends of my parents, uh, you know, um, would hire, would commission me to do portraits. I did probably did 150 of these portraits in a couple of years. I was getting a couple hundred dollars each. It wasn't a you know, I wasn't getting rich from it, but somebody from Time Magazine saw one of my portraits, and that led to doing covers for Time Magazine. I mean, I, I never get there in just a moment, but I'm yeah. back for just a moment. I want to get back to your father for a moment, Sorry. yeah. Um, because I'm really a bit, you know, big proponent of mentors and uh, lessons that you learn. What are some of the life lessons that you learned from your father uh, that he instilled in you that you still carry with you to? this day uh it's interesting because and this is not to diminish his influence because he had a great influence which i'll tell you about in a second but he never gave me art lessons he never sat me on his knee and taught me how to draw he never showed me how to paint he never showed me how he did his magic once in a while i'd poke my head in and if he wasn't really in the middle of a job he'd let me come in the room because he told me apparently when i was three years old, I wandered into his studio once and knocked over the water uh, thing that held the brushes that had water in it. And it spilled on an assignment he'd worked all night long on. So uh-huh. I was, I was, a, what do you call it? Um, banned from the studio. So I never had, a, you know, again, never got an art, a single art lesson from my father. But the thing that I think turned out to be more important was he had the most, and this I just you know realized that in adulthood later, he had the most incredible work ethic. He would take an take on an assignment, and if he had to stay up to four in the morning, he would never make an excuse. I never heard of me making an excuse for not getting work done on time because he always he never failed to do that. Mm. He'd do whatever it took. If he had to cancel a party or not go to a party or not do a thing, or even if it meant not taking us somewhere but and i might not have liked it at the time but as again in adulthood and uh that turned out i think you know talent is one thing but i think you can overcome even a mediocre talent with having a really good work ethic which she definitely gave me Uh, did you have that uh at the beginning as well or did it take time for you to develop that yourself no, I think it did because when I got these portraits commissions of, and they were friends of my parents, so I felt this responsibility. I didn't want to let my parents down. They're the ones who are saying, you know, our son, look what our son did. And they go, oh, we want one of those, you know. And um, so I felt a great responsibility. And I think maybe, you know, unconsciously, subconsciously, I just knew I had to do this. I had to get it done right. And I had to do it when I promised it. And I think it just, I never... At that point, I don't think I ever related it to, to what I witnessed my father, how he worked. Mm-hmm. But a little later in life, uh, maybe in my 20s, 30s, I realized, oh, that's where that came from. Why are people, you know, they're, they're, I don't know. I was dependable. I was mm-hmm. dependable, I guess. I, I mm-hmm. feel, I mean, I'm, pr- I'm not proud of anything. I don't think I'm the, so not the most talented artist in the room, but uh I could be depended on to deliver when I said I was. Well, well as your career started to unfold, um, who were some of the mentors along the way that you f- would like to give credit to who have shaped uh, the man that you are today? Mm. 
uh yeah that's interesting you know i don't know that there was well i had a college roommate that was um that was very uh supportive and um showed me i demonstrated again he was sort of a role model but not not a direct not like a mentor you know teacher student type of thing but um he just kind of like he was the first person i knew that kind of like broke the rules and like i'm not gonna do that i'm gonna do this well the assignment was to do this who cares i'm doing what i want to do and then it's like okay and then you know he would do things for a cl for a class assignment that had nothing to do with what they were asked to do but he would get oh, hey what a great job his name was lee wait well, look at the lee's great because he he thought out of the box of what all the cliches and i said but you know and i was always stuck in the authoritarian thing of you do what you're told and you know this is um, here's the box i'm in right now you know here's the, <laughs> you behave and you do what you're told and um I, so i wasn't a rebel a renegade but it, it creatively it freed me up a great deal to show me that you know what i, I don't have to i don't I, I don't have to box in my creative instincts I think that was good for you and good for Lee. Yeah. Uh, moving forward uh, again to uh, uh, Time Magazine, how did they become aware of you and how did that uh, begin to unfold for you? Because that was the beginning. Would you consider that your first big break? Yeah, well, actually, it sounds weird because, I mean, no, I didn't ask for any of these things. I would never in a million years thought to pursue these things. My first big break was a U.S. postage stamp. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so... Go figure. Uh, I don't know, you know, that, that and, and you know what? My father's really directly a responsible, indirectly, well, a, f a friend, an artist friend of his in, in our town, Stephen DeHanos, who's a well-known, he painted 150 Saturday evening post covers. He was kind of the Norman Rockwell. He was kind of on a par with Norman Rockwell, maybe not quite as well-known, but as uh, on the part artistically and did that Americana kind of scenic stuff. And he lived in town and he was friends with my father and he, my, I was starting to paint and my brother was doing these big childlike paintings, like a big flower, big childlike, like it was painted by a six year old, but it was six mm -hmm. feet tall and six feet. So Stephen DeHanos asked my father if he wanted to have a family art exhibit. And um, cause he knew his two sons were dabbling in art. So we had this exhibit and Stephen DeHano saw my work, my pop artwork. And at the time he was in charge of assigning, he was the head of the Citizens Stamp Advisory Committee, which was the talent recruiter for postage stamps. And he approached me and said, I've been given this assignment for a stamp and they want a young person to do the stamp. They want it to be symbolic that a young person, because it was about drug, preventing drug abuse. And which was, you know, was and still is, you know, uh, an epidemic mm -hmm. in the country. And they wanted a young person to do this as to represent um, a positive aspect of youth or whatever. So, yeah. So he, uh, he gave me the assignment to do the postage stamp. Um, was that uh, because of uh, the issue of the drug, abu uh, drug use mm -hmm. and abuse? Is that what led you to the Reagans? No, you know, that I just, no, and I don't, it may have, you know, I don't to this again, I don't know why I've tried to track these things down. <laughs> One day I'm at, I lived in this dumpy little apartment in town. I'd moved out of my house and there's a little cardboard box at the foot of my door to the entrance of my apartment. And I picked it up and rattled it. And I hear something, you know, I mean, something rattled inside. And I look at the return address and all it says was White House, Washington, D.C. <laughs> <laughs> no and i thought this is a joke you know and it's lee or somebody's just goofing on me and um i actually opened it like i, was, I thought a thing was going to jump out you know like it was like peanut the peanut brittle boxes um cans so, so what was in it was a wooden egg i mean a pure just a raw uh, an egg-shaped piece of wood you know like and and, and a note and it never told me where, how they got my name it was probably maybe it was from the postage stamp it was ne i was never told and it said you have been chosen you're one of 50 artists who've been chosen uh to do an easter egg for this year's easter egg uh role at 
Ronald Reagan's at the White House. And um, so I did a little research, but I knew I knew first of all he played um, Newt Rockney in the in the movies, you know, the football yeah. uh, star quarterback. Yeah. Yeah. So I painted and the egg is perfect. I painted it like a little football. And I, you know, I a little laces and I dabbled, you know, spattered paint to give it that little pigskin look to it. And and on the back, I think he was called the Gipper in the movie. So I said right. ded dedicated to the Gipper. And it turns out the, the day of the Easter egg roll uh, was predicted there was going to be a terrible storm. So it was canceled. And I never got to go to the White House. But I get a call out of the blue, like the next day or two, a couple of days later. And somebody said, this is the press secretary from the White House. We just thought you'd like to know that um, out of all the eggs that were presented for the Easter egg roll, uh, the president picked yours to put on his desk. And I went, oh my, that's amazing. I said, can I, can I come, you know, as a tourist and then maybe get a special thing to take a picture of on, on, on his desk? And she said, no, of course not. And I said, could you take a picture of it? I mean, this is before iPhones or anything, but I said, could somebody on the White House staff take a picture of it and send it to me? No, that's out of the question. So so I, I've been telling the story on and on and on again. And somebody said once, like five years ago, have you checked the internet? And I was like, if you check Google Images? And I went, oh my God. So I Googled. Uh, President Reagan, Oval Office, President Reagan, whatever, hundreds and hundreds of images. I finally found one with my egg on his desk. That's amazing. What a yeah. great story. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Uh, and so the postage stamp and then Time Magazine, um, when did you start getting this reputation uh, of being, first of all, somebody that would be available uh, to say yes or no to people? When did the calls start coming in? Well, there wasn't a lot of call. These were so isolated incidents that just hard. The, the Time Magazine thing, I had done a portrait, the very first pop art portrait I ever did, this may be out of chronological order, but was my last year at college. And a friend of mine, Barry Tashin, was a musician. And he was chosen, this is a famous story in itself, his group, the Remains, Barry and the Remains, they started in Boston. They were chosen to open for the Beatles on the Beatles' last tour across America in 1968 or nine, I think, or seven, whatever. Yeah, 67. 67. 67. 67. And Candlewood Park, it was their last. So my friend, Barry Tashin, and his group opened for the Beatles on this cross-country tour. My parents sent me a picture of Barry in the newspaper saying, oh, look what your friend Barry's up to. You know, look what Barry's going on tour with the Beatles. So I was inspired to paint a picture of Barry from this photograph in a pop art style. So I painted it. I sent it home. My father entered it in a local contest, in a local uh, gallery thing. It got it got accepted. Barry's father bought it. Then um, my father decided, or before that, he, he, he said, is it OK if I take it into New York? to a gallery to show them. And he brought it into New York. The gallery was kind of ambivalent. They said, well, you know what? We'll put it in our window for a week and see if anything happens, see if any there's any. Turns out it's like a block from the Time Life building. The art director from Time Life is on her lunch hour and she's walking down 57th Street and she it's on the second story even. Just, mm -hmm. And she looks up and... And she says, oh, that's exactly the style we're looking for for our next cover. And she goes up to the gallery and says, who's the artist? So it wasn't on a reputation. It was just that. So I did the first time cover I did was Spiro Agnew. Your listeners are old enough to remember the Nixon's yeah. vice president was mm -hmm. resigned in disgrace, Spiro Agnew. And they wanted me to do a pop art style portrait of him, light and shade. So, you know, good and evil. And so my portraits were then were very, were silhouettes of, you know, the dark side and the light side. And, um, and then I did, 
I did many assignments for them. Only four made it as covers. They have a thing where they ask artists to do it. They will assign maybe five, six artists and photographers for one cover subject. And then when the, it comes close to the publication date, they'll pick one to see which one maybe fits the time better. So I have, I probably did over 20 assignments for them, but four made it as covers. So, um, well, that's a pretty good record. Don't you think? I, I'm happy with it. I, the, the, it <laughs> I mean, that's great. The diamonds paid it, paid $500 each. So I had a good year, $500 each. If I did 20 in one year, no, it wasn't probably 20 over two years. So what's, what's, I can't even do the math. So what is that? $5,000 or something. Yeah. yeah. So, um, then if you got a cover, they paid you $2,000. So I got four covers over two years. So that's $8,000. So, you know, that was good money back then for me. I mean, I was living on my own and in a little apartment that didn't cost much, but I was still working. I think I was still working at Pepperidge Farm, the uh, night shift. How long did it take you before you amassed enough art to have your first exhibit? Um. Yeah, when did I, um, uh, oh, I, yeah, that's interesting. I uh, and thought, I Silverman, there's a, a local artist guild here called the Silvermine Guild in New Canaan, which was established, like, a, literally, they're celebrating their 100th year, so 19, you know, 1923, I guess, is 100 years. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, yeah, so out of, based on that, based on that one picture my friend Barry uh, bringing it in or, uh, you know, to, to apply, you had to be curated in or juried in to, to be a member. Uh, it wasn't just paying your dues and being a member. So, and then, yeah, so my first show, um, my very first show was uh, probably one person show was in 1960, the year after college, 68. Wow. And well, then, I and that led to more, Kind of commissioned portraits and um and uh and not and a couple and other you know i'd enter other exhibits one at a time the silver mine thing i had like 10 pieces in it so i was working really hard doing these big these, i wanted to make these big impressive pieces now how did the lenticular art begin and this is something that i've learned about just simply mm. from researching uh you uh, and, it, you know, I've, I've got a little information on the bottom of the screen, but if you can talk about lenticular art and how you got into that modality. Yeah. It actually started, and I'll just go out of screen here for a minute to grab something because I wasn't anticipating this, but it just, I'll, I'll, be right, I'll be right back here. Okay, so. I have an image here as well. Uh, I've got this here. This is the one that... Oh yeah, okay. That's one. Yeah, I started doing a series. I love hands. I'm doing a, and um, we'll lead up to that. What, um, but the very first thing that started me on this path was um, when my father passed away um, in nineteen in the nineties, I guess. Um, my brother and I had, you know, my mother asked us to go through all his stuff and everything. And there was a folder of, of birthday cards. He'd saved all the birthday cards that my relatives had sent me. And my aunt had sent me this. I don't know if this will show up. But you can see this is a lenticular. This little thing here mm -hmm. is a tiny little lenticular. And you can see it's a baseball player <laughs> swinging a bat. And these were Cracker Jack prizes also in the day. Uh, yeah, I did. Yes, and they were called Winkies because mm -hmm. you could one. The one was or the most famous one was an eye that winked at you, you know. And if you right. turned it in your hands, so this thing is literally one inch square. And I don't know. I found it in my. Again, I used to see the one that there was a, a. It was the the face of Jesus Christ. Do you remember this? Yeah, yes. And that was very, you know, and er, I mean, every Catholic home had that <laughs> on the wall. You walked by, and he opened his eyes. Or that's right. <laughs> And people have sent me, um, yeah, it, it, so, I, yeah, I get sent, people set, find stuff in museums and they said, oh, you know, it, and it's great. It's a wonderful medium. But up to that point, it was just a gimmick. It was a novelty. So this little card and that one day, and I'm, I kept it for years looking at it. It just fascinated me. It was like calling to me, but I didn't know why or how. And I don't know. I looked at it one time and I thought, 
these are so magical. I mean, I'm so engaged in this little thing. Why couldn't this be bigger? Why has anybody made these bigger? And, you know, wouldn't these be fan? Even this baseball player, what if he was two feet wide by two feet tall? Wouldn't that be great to look at in a gallery? And thank thankfully for the internet, I had a means to do some research and, uh, I, I didn't even know what it was called then, but I found out it was called lenticular. And then I started Googling the word okay. and then I got because of you. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I found uh, there's places that I found the place that made little things like this. And I'd say, I want to make, can you, I, I was even starting modestly. I said, I want to make like one that's 10 inches big. Oh, that can't be done. You can't do that. You know that we can't do that. Well, then I said, well, we could, but we'd have to order a thousand of them because it would be too much prep work to just make one. I'd have to charge you $5,000 to make one. But if you order a thousand, that $5,000, each one will cost you $5. I, go, I just want one. Well, it's, you can't, ha you can't have it. It can't be done. And anyway, I won't go into all the details of all the research, but I finally found somebody in Las Vegas who taught me how, that there is a way he invented software to allow to allow custom lenticulars to be made and um he well, shared you know, when i think of lenticular art now and uh you will be the first uh name that pops in my head but are there other artists that do this uh as well that you're familiar with yeah i don't know them by name but when i was when i started out um I was actually listed on the Adobe Photoshop, Adobe's website in the Photoshop section as one of six artists in the country that were doing lenticular work because Photoshop was trying to have a filter that would make help you make lenticulars, but nobody was interested. I mean, it was like six of us that cared. But um, and now there's 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 more. I don't know who they are. I mean, I get I get emails from all over the country or world actually asking me to teach them how to do it. And I try my best, but you know, you have to be sitting with somebody and show them the software. It's not brain surgery, but it's a process. And it's not, a lot of it's technical with Photoshop. And a lot of it is just the aesthetic of what mm -hmm. you're going to do with the two images. And, 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 and a lot of them are just decorative. You know, they'll, I mean, I, you can go to Walmart and get a lenticular. I saw one there a few days ago of a tree in summer and then you turn it in the same tree in, in fall. So it's right. green, then it's orange. And actually I think it's a three part or four part. And then it, then it's snow on it. And then there's winter, the leaves fall off. Exactly. Yeah. And, and um, I think it's 10 bucks, uh, but you know, but so, but I do lenticulars of my own uh, message. So the first, one of the very first ones I did to demonstrate, you know, the capability of this, this was my, I did it with my mother. This was a picture of my mother, her high school yearbook picture. Yes. People ask me, oh, did you did you take both pictures? No, I wasn't there yet. I wasn't there. <laughs> I, I, I didn't attend my mother's high school graduation, unfortunately. But uh, later, when she, so she's 17 years old in this picture. And then when I found this picture and I discovered the lenticular, I thought, wow, I could, I could, I always wanted to be a filmmaker, but I, that never panned out. So I thought these are going to be my little movies. I'm going to make a movie of my mother's life with two pictures. The picture when she's 17 and this picture when she's 97. So there's an 80 year. This is a story of her life. This is 80 years of her life in two pictures. And um, I posed her. And of course, I took the second picture and I posed her the same way with her hands. And uh, that's kind of, you know, maybe it shows her reaction when she saw it. Well, first of all, it took a lot of convincing. She's a very modest, shy person, and she didn't want me to take her picture at all. And I said, just let me, I won't do anything until you see it. And then when she saw it, she was amazed, and she gave me permission to show it, and it became my, literally my calling card, because I made a card. I made a little, um, I made a little business card out of the, here's the little version. I made a little business card out of it. So it is my calling card. To demonstrate, people say, what do you do? Or what is lenticular? And if I show them that, then they understand. Um, so yeah, that that started it, really started it all. Uh, once people saw the magic of it and it was big, nobody had ever seen, people would say, oh, I remember Cracker Jacks, but they were this big and now they're seeing it this big. And how did you do it? And and now I've made them, you know, 
to sort of plant my flag in the lenticular universe, I, the, one of the next ones I did was a giant, like six feet tall and four feet wide. Um, and then I went back to more normal sizes. Um, I saw the one that you did of Lawrence Langner, uh, which yeah. was incredible. Um, you just had an exhibit at the UN. Uh, was that all lenticular art? Yeah, and that great little title card you did for your show here with my showing me it standing in, in the UN. Um, yeah, so the premise of that, this, the exhibit, there it is. The exhibit is called Signs of Compassion. And it's based on a poem by Emily Dickinson, which was appeared at the end of that little video you ran at the beginning. And I think I almost know it by heart. If I can stop, there's only 34 words in the poem or something. If I can stop one heart from breaking, I shall not live in vain. If I can ease one life the aching, or cool one pain, or help one robin unto his nest again, I shall not live in vain. That's the poem by Emily Dickinson. It's the poem isn't called Signs of Compassion. I named it that, but uh, I give her I'll give her credit for the poem. <laughs> but um, so the reason it's Signs of Compassion. So you know, people have often said especially with my mother's piece, you know, your work really speaks to me. I've heard that over and over, not just about my own work, but other, I've heard, overheard eavesdropped and people will say to an artist, your work really speaks to me. And I said, what if it work? What if it could, what if art could speak? What if it literally could speak, but not vocally? And I said, the only way is sign language and lenticular lends itself perfectly to sign language because lenticular pretty much only allows two movements, you know, back and forth, two mm -hmm. images. And, and sign, most, Virtually all sign language, there's some exceptions, are two, are two uh, gestures. I mean, it really just one, but if is like, if I can stop one. So, you know, so I photographed 30 people. I broke the poem down into 30 words and phrases, and I photographed friends, diverse group of friends and people in my community, and they each did, signed a word from the poem, and I made a lenticular out of it. So the person who did the word stop, this was picture one, and picture two was this, because that's the gesture for stop. Mm -hmm. um, if is this, boom, if I is this, if I, so your hand, one hand gesture was here, there. Mm -hmm. um, so what you saw, that line, there's 30 images and reading from left to right or right to left, however it's arranged. If you walk by it, it's literally like a movie. It's like a, a flip book or a movie of, of people signing, literally signing the poem about compassion. Um, so yeah, the UN, it just came down last week. It was up for six weeks. Uh, I, a friend of mine did a, did a braille piece to the show, which is a freestanding wheel with braille on it. Amazing. It's you know, really one covered. of my very best friends just passed away who was blind oh. and, uh, I learned so much from her and how she saw the world and the saw is the word that she would use. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. It, well, it was such a privilege. We were told later, well, actually in the video, the woman says it, it's not too clear. The, the, the Japanese woman is, it's the first time ever that an exhibit, most of the, all the exhibits from the UN are sponsored by member countries. So if Norway mm -hmm. says, Oh, we, uh, we have a, we, we want to do a show on, you know, um, windmills. I mean, you know, the, the UN will schedule them in. We are the first independent artists to have ever been sponsored wow. from an agency within the United Nations. And it was an agency that deals with diversity and disabilities. So in which we covered, you know, because there's in, in my group of 30 portraits, you know, there's many ethnicities covered, there's many nationalities covered. Uh, African American, Chinese, Taiwanese, Hawaiian men, men, women, you know, anyway, so it's, it covered all the bases for the UN and it was just stunning to have it there. They have this beautiful, I'll never find another wall like this in the world, but no, I don't. 102 foot wall in the lobby and my work just fit. What was that experience like walking in and seeing all of that in front of you and seeing your vision come <laughs> to life like that? Uh, it's indescribable when I and I even you just ran that little video, which I've seen maybe I, maybe the last time I looked at it was a month ago because the opening was about was October 9th, October 17th. Um, yeah, I just got chills. I I, I mean, it, it's remind of like, did that really happen? I mean, it just I 
I still, it's hard to comprehend. I mean, I'd never seen it. I'd done that, that exhibit existed before, but there was never room for it in a row. It was always in a grid and smaller, like the pieces were like this. So I could do like six by five by five across and six down and it would maybe take up you know, so much space on a wall in a gallery. So the show you already, excuse me for interrupting, but yeah. you had already put this idea together uh, before the UN uh, called or uh, how did it happen that you ended up there and did it unfold as you had envisioned it? Yeah, well, it unfolded going backwards. It unfolded beyond my wildest expectations. But no, the exhibit was created six years ago uh, for the Westport Public Library <laughs> I was an artist in I was their first artist in residence there six, seven years ago. And as a thank you gift or something, they said, we want to give you a one person show, come up with something. And uh, my role as artist in residence was to involve the community in art projects and, and engage the community. So I was thinking about community. How do I, anyway, to compress the story, I, I decided on, uh, there's a whole other backstory of why Emily Dickinson because my son, when he was in college, lived directly across the street from Emily Dickinson's house. And mm -hmm. I went to visit it one day and that triggered Emily Dickinson. I would not, I'm not a great fan of poetry, but I fell in love with her poetry yeah, because yeah. of that. Because mm -hmm. my son lived across, literally across the street from her, from her house. <laughs> and, uh, anyway, so I did this, this con concept came to mind. I created it for the library. The pieces were all like kind of this big and they were spread out on kiosks. So there was no continuity really. Then it went to a gallery in Hartford across the street from the Gall Gallaudet School for the Deaf, which is the first school for the deaf in the country. So that had significance. And then it went to a it went to Montefiore Hospital in the Bronx. Mm. And then it went to the St. Joseph School for the Deaf in the Bronx. And then it went to uh, the Burke Rehabilitation <laughs> Center in the Bronx. I mean, it's made the round and that from there, the UN, somebody saw it that either worked at the UN um, or word got around. So I never applied, you know, the last thing, like the time thing, the stamp, who, why would I, how, who am I to think I could apply to the, to the UN? So word got around and they invited us to make a, pr a proposal or invited me to make a proposal. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then I realized with the length of, and they said, come visit. And we measured and I realized I got to make these bigger. This wall is 102 feet long. My little pieces like this will take up, you know, 20 feet. So I had them all, rem I remade them all two feet square. And now they're all, they were all spaced out about a 10 inches apart and filled that wall. And it was breathtaking because I had never seen them in a linear, the way they were meant to be really, but first time. <laughs> What I love about your story, I, and I've interviewed, you know, I interview mostly people in the theater. Um, so it's, this has been re refreshing to, uh, to go in another direction today. Uh, but what I love about your story is it, it seems to me uh, as if these things have just happened in your life. Um, serendipity being at the right place, at the, you know, some people map out a career plan, a manif uh, manifestation, that they, this is what I'm going to do. This is how it's going to be done. And it seems to me as if you've just had this, what seems uh, to me as a charmed life of these, you know, incredible things happening in your life. Well, you know, it's, I, I've thought about it a lot and I can't, you know, cause people think, and I, and I'm embarrassed because there's so many, and I'm not trying to be, you know, this false modesty. I, I'm, I can't, I used to be a painter. I was I was a pretty bad painter. I mean, I'm not. There's other photographers. I mean, I I, I don't know. You're right. I, I'm at the right place at the right time. There's no explaining it because there are more deserving people in terms of talent. But I don't know what what things magical things have come together for me. But it has been charmed that way. Um, One of my favorite books is The Year of Saying Yes by Shonda oh, Rhimes. Do you yeah. know the book? Yeah, I know the book. And she was always this person who was always saying no to everybody. Uh, they would want, uh, you know, after the success of her shows on ABC, uh, all of a sudden Oprah's calling and uh, Jimmy uh, Kimmel is calling and all of these people are calling and she's saying no to all of them because that wasn't a part of the business that she wanted to be a part of. And 
she decided one year that she was just going to say yes to every opportunity and everything turned around for her. So maybe that's the secret. Well, you know, people tease me, uh, you know, because I, I volunteer and go volunteer. I donate my scrap. I'm a graphic artist by, by profession now. You know, I, I, I've been for 40 years, design brochures and logos and posters and all sorts of, you know, collateral material, commercial stuff. And, you know, if a charity and not, I won't do it for a commercial thing, but if a charity, the Red Cross or somebody, the United Way, somebody said, oh, we need a poster good, or design an invitation, I'll do it. And friends will tease me and go, you know, you should charge them. You should charge them. And I go, why should I charge them? I can do it's no it's it's a, it's a, I'm helping. I can't give them a write a big check. And it's a great and they tease me about oh, mix can't say no. Well, the flip side is, yeah, I try. Maybe it's because I'm open to stuff and that goes out into the universe. I don't know. I don't get cosmic about it, but there's something going on. Well, you said, you, you, you said something earlier and a red uh, light went off over my head. And that was the fact you said that you were going to put your flag on it. Well, you designed the flag for Westport. <laughs> Good segue. <laughs> nice segue. <laughs> and when you, when you said that, I said, this is just perfect. And this happened in 1985. Yeah. Um, and uh, how did that, how did they just reached out to you and said, we'd like you to design our flag? Uh, you know, there's another thing. Yeah, well, you can see it has a pop art look to it. But what happened, the genesis of that, not picky, well, Rodney Dangerfield, the comedian, had just moved to Westport. And he put out the word to the town hall that he wanted to do something as a, as a gesture to the town. He just didn't want to be a, I mean, he was a reclusive person in town. And he was looking for respect. He was truly. He, I think that's the basis of it. It's interesting. I never thought of it that way. I think he really, deep down, he did need that respect, and he he told the town, I, "Is there anything I can do for you for the town?" And they said, um, "Well, you know, we're thinking." This is before I was involved. They said, "You know, the Westport's never had a town flag, and many of our surrounding towns have flags. We were thinking of having one made or creating one." And they, he said, "Well, I will underwrite. I will fund it." Uh, then somebody submitted my name to be the person to do the flag. They didn't, it wasn't a contest. They didn't ask 10 people and pick my, they asked me to design the flag. And uh, again, that, that might be the biggest thrill because it's my hometown. Mm -hmm. And, um, and yeah, and uh, it was 19, the significance 1985 was West Westport was founded in 1835. So it was our, I think they called it the sesquicentennial, so it's 150 yeah. years. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a thrill. It's still waving today, 40 years later. Um, they're still on all the flagpoles, the community buildings, the schools, the town hall. So I, yeah, I, you know, it, it could just be, again, yeah, I have a modicum of talent, but maybe it's just that people say, you know, he's easy to work with. He's dependable. You don't have to worry whether he's going to show up or whether he's going to do it when he... May I think it comes down to that. It's a really good lesson for kids. You know, it's not like, oh, well, I don't, I'll, I'll never be as talented as you. I'll never be as... as good. Well, I've got one more thing that we're mm. going to run out of time. I could go on forever with you mm. because there's so many hats that you wear. Um, what if? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Tell us about your book. <laughs> Just happened to have it here. <laughs> yeah, so That's my question, my what if? Yeah, the what if book. I think it's still on, available on Amazon. This was done maybe ten years ago. Um, well, this came out of a divorce twenty-five years ago, and uh, I was going to a therapist. Try to make this really brief. I was going to a, a therapist, a counselor, to overcome the trauma of the divorce, and um, I kept saying, you know, what if? what if, what if I go, you know, what if I don't have the money? What if she takes my house or what if I lose my house? Not if she takes it. What if I lose my house? What if I lose my son? What if I, what if this, I kept doing all these, you know, hand wringing what ifs. And she said, write them down, write all your, what if, write your, all your worst worries down and bring them to the next thing. And so they were very personal, but as I was writing them down, I said, you know, we all have what ifs. Mm -hmm. I mean, we all do it. I mean, every day and they're not all in important what if i don't lose the job you know maybe for you what if my guest doesn't show up what am i gonna do <laughs> that happened if, yesterday. so <laughs> i was gonna ask you you know there's always the word what if i can't log in oh my god right. so 
anyway, I started to try to, so it took a period of five years, very casually writing, jotting down these what if questions uh, that I thought were more universal. Like my, my favorite one is the first one, if I may read it. it says, what if the most important moment in your life is this one? Can you handle the power it gives you to choose how you will spend the next one? So it's all these little, everyone in their page, 90 pages are very short I things. Wait to get my copy. I'm going to order it. Yeah, yeah. that's great. Anyway. That's, well, that's... I want to thank you uh, for being here. I'm going to give you the final word in just a moment. Uh, it could be about anything that we spoke about today that you want to build upon, anything that we didn't talk about that you mm -hmm. wish we had, or just any final message that you want to leave everyone with. Um, I want to thank everyone for showing up. Uh, first of all, in this business, we don't take it lightly uh, when you show up. And I'm sure I can speak for Migs when I say that. <laughs> so the fact that you spent an hour with us uh, is great. And uh, Migs, um, the information for your podcast is on your website, uh, which will be on my YouTube channel. So okay. people will be able to follow you and keep up to date with what you're doing and everything. Um, I'm going to give my final word. I always say at the end of every show um, to uh, go out and do something nice for somebody else without expecting anything in return. Uh, go to your Facebook friends list. I know most of you are on Facebook. Uh, and uh, pull up the first name that pops up in your feed and reach out with a phone call. Not an email message, not a text message, not a private inbox message, a phone call. And let that person know the impact that they've made on your life. And by doing so, uh, you're going to make an impact on their life. Uh, I have a dear friend, uh, Sean Moniger, and he says, we're all in this uh, same storm, uh, but we're in different size boats. And I always say, I don't care what size boat you're on, as long as you have a skipper by your side. Yeah. And with that, I'm going to leave the screen. Migs, I'm going to turn it over to you. And when you say goodbye, uh, I will end the show so you don't have to worry about how to get out of this or anything. Uh, and uh, you're always welcome here. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Richard. It was a real total joy. And I, first of all, I have to thank Joel Vig, uh, who's been very supportive and um, uh, worked together on the Langner uh, portrait for the Playhouse. And uh, and he's uh, he's works with a friend of mine who he's, has written plays with um, Elizabeth Fuller or helped her, you know, with plays, playwriting. And uh, one last note, because it came full circle. So I have a degree in scene design. I never used it until a month ago when I was asked by Liz Fuller to design a set for her son's play, Cheese Fries and Chili Dips, um, which is about her son's, um, you know, reminiscence about his career as a golf pro and his, and his uh, struggles with uh, mental illness. So Full circle, 60 years later, I finally got to design a set with my degree. Um, but thank you so much. Uh, this has been great. And I, your, your attitude, your life attitude is great. I, my take on, you said we're all on boats on the water. My thing is we're all, I put a little different spin on it. We're all passengers on the ship together. And, you know, if you see somebody hanging over the rail, throwing up, you should go over there and put your arm around them or, uh, but we all, we're all passengers on the earth together. And um, I think we have a responsibility to, to look after each other. And with that, I'll say goodbye. <laughs>